Go ahead. The Book of Ruth. A gentle her heroine. A gentle, a Gentile convert. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, and she left speaking unto her. So they two went until they came to Beth Bethlehem. It came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. They said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. And I, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which, turned, which returned out of the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Ruth 1, verse 16 through 22. The lovely idol of Ruth is in sharp contrast with the bloody and turbulent annals of Judges. It completes but does not contradict these and happily reminds us of what we are apt to forget in reading such pages, that no times are so wild, but that in them are quiet corners, green oases, all the greener for their surroundings, where life glides on in peaceful isolation from the tumult. Men and women love, the mar love and work and weep and laugh, the gossips of Bethlehem talk over Naomi's return. They said in verse 19 is Finfinim. Boaz stands among his corn and no sounds of war disturb them. Thank God. The blackest times were not so dismal in reality as they look in history. There are clefts in the grim rock and flowers blooming, sheltered in the clefts. The peaceful pictures of this little book, multiplied many thousand times, have to be set as a background to the lurid pictures of the book of Judges. The text begins in the middle of Naomi's remonstrance with her two daughters-in-law. We need not deal with the former part of the conversation, nor follow Orpah as she goes back to her home and her gods. She is the first in the sad series of those not far from the kingdom of God, who needed but a little more resolution at the critical moment and for one of it, shut themselves out from the covenant and sank back to a world which they had half renounced. So these two lonely widows are left, each seeking to sacrifice herself for the other. Who shall decide which was the more noble and truly womanly in her self-forgetfulness, the elder, sadder heart, which strove to secure for the others some joy and fellowship at the price of its own deepened solitude, or the younger, which steeled itself against entreaties and cast away friends and country for love's sweet sake. We rightly praise Ruth's vow. We should not forget Naomi's unselfish pleading to be left to tread her weary path alone. Ruth's passionate burst of tenderness is immortal. It has put into fitting words for all generations the deepest thoughts of loving hearts and comes to us over all the centuries between as warm and living as when it welled up from that gentle, heroic soul. The two strongest emotions of our nature are blended in it, and each gives a portion of its fervor, love and religion. So closely are they interwoven that it is difficult to allot to each its share in the united stream. But without trying to determine to which of them the greater part of its volume and forces do, and while conscious of the danger of spoiling such words by comments weaker than themselves, we may seek to put into distinct form the impressions which they make. We see in them the heroism of 
gentleness. Put the sweet figure of the Moabitess beside the heroes of the Book of Judges, and we feel the contrast. But is there anything in its pages more truly heroic than her deed as she turned her back on the blue hills of Moab and chose the joyless lot of the widowed companion of a widow aged and poor in a land of strangers, the enemies of her country and its gods? It is easier far to rush on the spheres of the foe than to whirl in a cloud of battle than to choose with open eyes so dreary a lifelong path. The gentleness of a true woman covers a courage of a patient, silent sort, which in its meek steadfastness is nobler than the contempt of personal danger, which is vulgarly called bravery. It is harder to endure than to strike. The supreme type of heroic as of all virtue is Jesus Christ, whose gentleness was the velvet glove on the iron hand of an inflexible will. Of that best kind of heroes, there are few brighter examples seen in the annals of the church, which numbers its virgin martyrs by the score, than this sweet figure of Ruth, as the eager vow comes from her young lips, which had already tasted sorrow, and were ready to drink its bitterest cup at the call of duty. She may well teach us to rectify our judgments and to recognize the quiet heroism of many a modest life of uncomplaining suffering. Her example has a special message to women and exhorts them to see to it that in the cultivation of the so-called womanly excellence of gentleness, they do not let it run into weakness, nor, on the other hand, aim at strength for the loss of meekness. The yielding birch tree, the lady of the woods, bends in all its elastic branches and tossing ringlets of foliage to the wind that stands upright after storms that level oaks and pines. God's strength is gentle strength, and ours is likest his, and it is meek and lowly, like that of the strong son of God. Ruth's great words may suggest, too, the surrender which is the natural language of true love. Her story comes in among all the records, these records of bloodshed and hate, like a bit of calm blue sky among piles of ragged thunderclouds, or a breath of fresh air in the oppressive atmosphere of a slaughterhouse. Even in these wild times, there was still a quiet corner where love could spread its wings. The question has often been asked what the purpose of the Book of Ruth is, and various answers have been given. The genealogical table at the end, showing David's descent from her, the example which it supplies, the reception of a Gentile into Israel, and other reasons for its presence in Scripture, have been alleged, and no doubt correctly. But the Bible is a very human book, just because it is a divine one. And surely it would be no unworthy object to enshrine in its pages a picture of the noble working of that human love which makes so much of human life. The hallowing of the family is a distinct purpose of the Old Testament. And the beautiful example which this narrative gives of the elevating influence of domestic affection entitles it to a place in the canon. How many hearts, since Ruth spoke her vow, have found in it the words that fitted their love best? How often they have been repeated by quivering lips and heard as music by loving ears. How solemn and even awful is that perennial freshness of words which came hot and broken by tears from lips that have long ago moldered into dust. What has made them thus enduring forever is that they express most purely the self-sacrifice which is essential to all noble love. The very inmost longing of love is to give itself away to the object loved. It is not so much a desire to acquire as to bestow, or rather, the antithesis of giving and receiving melts into one action, which has a twofold motion, one outwards to give, one inwards to receive. To love is to give oneself away. Therefore, all lesser givings are its food and delight. And when Ruth threw herself on Naomi's withered breast, a sobbed and sobbed out her passionate resolve, 
She was speaking the eternal language of love and claiming Naomi for her own in the very act of giving herself to Naomi. Human love should be the parent of all self-sacrificing as of all heroic virtues. And in our homes, we do not live in love as we ought, unless it leads us to the daily exercise of self-suppression and surrender, which is not felt to be loss but the natural expression of our love, which it would be a crime against it and a pain to ourselves to withhold. If Ruth's temper lived in our families, it would be true houses of God and gates of heaven. We hear in Ruth's words also that forsaking of all things, which is an essential of all true religion. We have said that it was difficult to separate in the words the effects of love to Naomi from those of adoption to Naomi's faith. Apparently, Ruth's adhesion to the worship of Jehovah was originally due to her love for her mother-in-law. It is in order to be one with her in all things that she says, Thy God shall be my God. And it was because Jehovah was Naomi's God that Ruth chose him for hers. But whatever the origin of her faith, it was genuine and robust enough to bear the strain of casting Chemosh and the gods of Moab behind her and setting herself with full purpose of heart to seek the Lord. Abandoning them was digging an impassable gulf between herself and all her past with its friendships, loves, and habits. Mm. She is one of the first, and not the least noble, of the long series of those who suffer the loss of all things and count them but dumb, that they may win God for their dearest treasure. We have seen how, in her, human love wrought self-sacrifice. But it was not human love alone that did it. The cord that drew her was twisted of two strands, her love to Naomi melted into her love of Naomi's God. Blessed they who are drawn to the knowledge and love of the fountain of all love in heaven by the sweetness of the characters of his representatives in their homes, and who feel that they have learned to know God by seeing him in dear ones, whose tenderness has revealed his and whose gracious words have spoken of his grace. If Ruth teaches us that we must give up all in order truly to follow the Lord. The way by which she came to her religion may teach us how great are the possibilities and consequently the duties of Christians to the members of their own families. If we had more elder women like Naomi, we should have more younger women like Ruth. Hmm. The self-sacrifice which is possible and blessed even to the inferior natures at the bidding of love is too precious to be squandered on earthly objects. Men's capacities for it, at the call of dear ones here, should be the rebuke of their grudging surrender to God. He gave the capacity that it might find its true field of operation in our relation to him. But how much more ready we all are to give up everything for the sake of our Naomi's than for his sake. And how we may be our own accusers if the measure of our devotion to them be contrasted with the measure of our devotion to God. Mm. Finally, we may see in Ruth's entrance into the religion of Israel, a picture of what was intended to be the effect of Israel's relation with the Gentile world. The household of Elimelech immigrated to Moab and, and whether that were right or wrong, they were there among heathens as Jehovah worshipers. They were meant to be missionaries. And in Ruth's case, the purpose was fulfilled. She became the first fruits of the Gentiles. And one aim of the book, no doubt, is to show how the believing Gentile was to be incorporated into Israel. Boaz rejoices over her and especially over her conversion and prays a full reward be given thee of Jehovah the God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. She is married to him, and becomes the ancestress of David, and through him of the Messiah. All this is a beautiful completion to the other side of the picture, which the fierce fighting and judges makes prominent, and teaches that Israel's relation to the nations 
around was not to be one of mere antagonism, but that they had another mission, the destruction, and were set in their land as the candlestick in the tabernacle, that light might stream out to the darkness of the desert. Hmm. The story of the Moabitess whose blood flowed in David's veins was a standing protest against the later narrow exclusiveness which the Gentiles' dogs, and which called Gentiles' dogs, and prided itself on outward connection with the nation, and the exact degree in which it lost real union with the nation's God and real understanding of the nation's mission. We have left ourselves no space to speak of the remainder of this passage, which is of less importance. It gives us a lively picture of the stir in the little town of Bethlehem as the two wayworn women came into it in their strange attire and attracting notice by traveling alone. As we have observed, they said in verse 19, is feminine. The women of the village buzzed around the strangers as they sat in silence, perhaps by that well at the gate of which long after David longed to drink. Wonder, curiosity, and possibly a spice of malice mingled in the question, is this Naomi? It is heartless at any rate. It had been better to have found them food and shelter than to have let them sit, a mark for a sharp tongue for sharp tongues. Naomi's bitter words seemed to be moved partly by a sense of the coldness of the reception. She realizes that she has indeed come back to a changed world, where there will be little sympathy except such as Ruth can give. It is with almost passion that she abjures her name Pleasant as a satire on her woeful lot and bids them call her bitter as a truer to fact now. The burst of sorrow is natural as she finds herself again where she had been a wife and mother and remembers happier things. Her faith wavers and her words almost reproach God. The exaggerations in which memory is apt to indulge color them. I went out full. She has forgotten that they went out to seek for bread. Hmm. Only remembers that Four went away, and three sleep in Moab. Possibly she thinks of their immigration as a sin, and traces her dear one's deaths to God's displeasure on its account. His testifying against her probably means that his providence in bereaving her witnessed to his disapprobation. But, whether that be so or not, her wild words are not those of a patient sufferer who bows to his will. But true faith may sometimes break down, and Ruth's trusting under the wings of Jehovah is proof enough that in the long years of lonely sorrow, Naomi's example had shown how peaceful and safe was the shelter there. Hmm. Interesting, huh? Well, that's a short expansion of a beautiful book. It is a shorter one for sure. But let's turn, we have still 10 minutes to turn to some details and book, look at it for sure. some further discussion. So let's to turn to chapter 4. So we see the concept King's Mary Redeemer mm. in action through Boaz. Am I the discussion? According to Moses' law, uh, take a process as Boaz begins to arrange for Ruth to be married, am I? Into his family, he thereafter becomes the king's married redeemer. Basically, has the right to claim the inheritance that pass on to the two widows, am I? Through family lineage. There is a law that is as a kinsman or a brother had the duty to marry the widow of the deceased brother in order to keep the family line going on. Make sense to you? To make the son after that family. So, with it, the word reward is actually, it means the legal rights. 
give this contest am i so it's red called all the rewards the legal endowment if we um basically inheritance and all other <laughs> social constructs under that covenant that fully given to why is not entitled to it in this case whether it be a gentile or one outside of the family so the double entry through ruth one is that she now considered Jew, no more a Gentile. Second, <coughs> it is she is married back into the inheritance that vacated by the deceased husband. Make sense here, you know. So now Boaz was able to restore that, pass on to a son. So the son, in a sense, that Boaz now making the hand. It's not actually a lineage on Boaz's right, am I? It's a lineage on whose right? On the brother, his bro this brother right, am I? That is given to Naomi, now pass on to Ruth as um, uh, um, a legal legal recipient of this birthright, basically, am I? Or this family right? And I make it sense to you. My English may be broken, but you can understand what I try to get at, right? So, yeah. The place is called Bethlehem or Ephrathah. Let's look at this one. Eleven. So, then the elders, all the people, and the geese said, "We are witnesses." I mean, the Lord made the woman who is coming to your home like Rachel and Lee. That Rachel and Lee is the ones. Who are entitled, am I, for Jacob's family to be uh, was like have a, have a sons, have many sons. So for Jacob, twelve tribes later on become what so all the children have the right to claim the inheritance. You know, in the time when they go into the promised land, all the sons, twelve tribes. Who would together build up the family of Israel? So you can see my point is that is this more than a love story. This is actually a restitution of uh, a legal construct and a social construct under God's covenantal promise. Uh, you know, through the past on generations of blessing and endowment. May you have standing Ephratha and be famous. In Bethlehem, that's very interesting, huh? Bethlehem and Ephratha. So that's where later on Jesus Christ was born. So this is a also David, you know, birthplace as well. This David's in, you know, where the tribe came from. I mean, you might have heard of this, but I want to re remind you. Turn with me to to my 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 car. Mecca, Mecca, and my five chapter. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, I want you to read a little bit. What you know, one and um, four. So one to four. I'm sorry, my five, mm -hmm. five chapter one to four. Rather, from two to four is okay. And you are talking about Micah, right? Yeah, M I C E H. I'm oh, sorry, I'll, Micah. Yeah, Micah. M I C E. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one, you said verse one to what now? I'm sorry. Verse two to four. Two to four. All right. Mm -hmm. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah. Out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old. From ancient times. Origins is a lineage, am I? You know, so who's a family line, basically? Make it sense to you? So, yeah. So, better me for us, I, in a sense, the lineage is always kept in Judah, you know, from Jacob until now, give a, um, a future Messiah the lineage, in a sense, because this is a mark of the past David time. Make it sense to you? You know, so, yeah, go ahead. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. You see the rest of brothers, 
this concept, right? So to join these lights into the concept, we would think the physical joined, which may be true, implied. Really, it is also implied a king's married redeemer, or the concept is in the New Testament called the adoption of the Psalms. Okay, the concept of adoption of Psalms. This is a hidden mystery, almost nobody talk about it. Seldom we've been talking about it. But when Paul talked about the adoption of Psalms, when, when other places would come the Jesus Christ being a redeemer, this is a Jewish mind in the background. Is a basically a family right as a song is uh, being activated and uh, will be actualized. That's also Paul's concept about the spirit is a deposit for the things to come. The word deposit is actually guarantee, actually means a birthright, okay? You are endowed with a given right when you are considered as a song. That's what it means. All through John, later on, Thomas Jesus Christ, when we see him as our Savior and Redeemer, in his name, we become born a new race, become a new name, new family, basically. Born of God, not mankind. We adopted as the sons. We have the right to become a sons of God. All those are in, share the same context, but the context came from this place called adoption or redeemed into a family heritage, okay? A, a covenantal blessing passed on through generations. So interesting, in the beginning I told you, uh, you know, what is a pure love in God's sight? Like David, Scott said, David have a heart for me. What it means, had great to do with this contest. Now then David's personal attributes, personal character. But rather, David understood his family heritage. And uh, the reason, the great reason why God raised him, even small among the clans, to be what? To be the, the king, to be a token of a great hope, even for his Lord. My Lord is on my right hand. You know, turn with him to Psalm. Uh, I think it's 78 in the Latin part, okay? That's a long psalm. Just want to impart something to you here. About this book. This book have a great importance. You understand David's life, therefore Messiah's life. In the, you know, what means the, uh, you know, King's my Redeemer. What it means the sons of God can impart or pass on a heritage by those who believe in, in him, you know. Member of God's household, what it means. What it means when he calls us brothers, you know. So all those laid on in Western culture, even today, especially popular, uh, popular Christianity, have been distorted to humanities, with human ways of considering brotherly love or you know, what it means to be redeemed, in what the state or what the relationship. Everything here is evidently based on common alcohol and family construct or generation construct. Whereas the other is almost like a you know sympathy and uh, human ideals. But that's not what God considered to be true, you know, so he's a covenantal God. According what? According what? Who's covenant? What covenant? The reading of ours will provide the background. What what the Lord deems what is means to have a covenant of people. So, is that making sense to you? So let's turn to Psalm seventy eight from seventy sixty seven to the end. Then we finish there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty familiar with this part. <laughs> I think you do. Mm -hmm. 67, start mm -hmm. there. Yes. Then he rejected the tents of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. But he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. He built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth that he established forever. He chose David, his servant, 
and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be a shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel as inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. There's a picture of a, a shepherd, am I? In two. <coughs> Lead to this hope of a redeemer. Redeemed more than of something or restore something. Redeemed into a culture or the people of peace and righteousness. With that, no one you wrap up for us, pray for us. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you that you are known to us in so many ways and different aspects, Lord, none of which uh, contradict themselves, or but come to form some truly majestic and unified whole, mm -hmm. Lord, of your expression, Lord, for your wisdom is uh, manifold, and it is made known to us in, in ways that enable us to... Uh, Lord, understand it in a way that is more than intellectual, Lord, but is life to us. Mm. Lord, it is um, spiritual nourishment mm. to us. Mm. Father, I, I thank you, Lord, for your uh, place in the heavenly realms and in our spiritual lives as our Redeemer. Mm. Lord, you understand this in a, a more perfect way. Mm. Lord, through the enlightenment of your spirit. Mm. Uh, Father, I do just thank you for such time as even as this, mm. or like this morning, that we can begin to touch on these subjects together, mm. together, and perhaps that you would uh, continue to bless mm. Lord, the time we spend and also those that ever may listen in on mm. the recording. Mm. Lord, touch every mind and heart uh, that is willing to receive from you. Have uh, destined for a higher knowledge. Mm. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Noah. Bless you. Have a great day. Okay, so yeah. It's gonna be a busy one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, can't get out anymore. So. No, it's, it's good. Okay. Bless, Bless you. Okay. Bye. All uh -huh. right. You have a good okay. Day too. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Uh huh.